Okay, I'm very, I'm sorry, I'm a little late today. Uh, the um, Parshas Vayishlach, again, a very, very interesting Parsha. All of these Parshios, of course, have so much meaning. Uh, Yaakov Avinu is returning to the land of Israel after being gone for many, many years. Uh, he was uh, gone 20 years in Laban's house. Uh, and then before that, there were 14 years in the yeshiva of Shein B'Ever. Um, we talked about the purpose of that yeshiva last week. And therefore, Yaakov has been away from Eretz Yisrael for uh, 34 years. <coughs> but he gets back and he hears that uh, his brother Esav has not gotten over his anger yet and Esav wants to kill him. And the Pusuk says that Yaakov is very frightened. And it uses two Lashonos, Vayira Yaakov Ma'ot, Yaakov is very afraid, Vayetzar Lo, and Yaakov is very distressed. He is afraid and he is distressed. Rashi says, what is he afraid of? We're going to look at each part of this. He is afraid that perhaps he will be killed, he is, or his family will be killed. He is literally afraid for his life. So let's stop right there. Why is Yaakov afraid that Esav is going to kill him? Many years before, when Yaakov left, and Yaakov had a dream, and he had a ladder, a vision of the ladder, of the angels going up and down the ladder, God promised him, I will bring you back to this land in peace. I will take care of you. I will protect you. 34 years ago, he was given that promise. God's promises are not like man's promises. You know, we make promises. Okay, you know, you can't really depend on it. Hashem promises. It's going to happen. So why is Yaakov afraid Bichlal? So the truth is, this is not my question. The Gemara itself asks this question. The Gemara in Brachos asks the question, why is Yaakov afraid if Hashem had given him a promise? So the Gemara's answer is, that Yaakov figures that even if God gives you a promise, there's a certain reciprocal obligation, meaning I will get the promise if I'm deserving, if I'm worthy. But if because of my sinful behavior, I am no longer worthy, perhaps God will, his promise is right, like a contract, meaning I, I agree to do something for you if you live up to your responsibilities. If you don't live up to your responsibilities, it's not gonna happen. So Yaakov is afraid, in the language of the Gemara, Shema Yigrom Hachet. Perhaps his sins will cause him to forfeit divine protection. Whereas that's Yaakov's modesty. I mean, Yaakov obviously didn't have those Averis, but in his modesty, he thought that perhaps he was sinful and undeserving of the divine promise that was made. That's why he's afraid. Now, the Rambam... Uh, in uh, the Hakdama to the Mishnayis asks a very, very interesting question. And I think over the years I've mentioned it, but may, maybe not to all the people here. And that is, the Rambam asked a question. You know, in the time of the Beis HaMikdash, there used to be prophets. Actually, not during the Second Temple, but during the First Temple, there were prophets. And even before there was a Beis HaMikdash, right? That's our Tanakh. And let's say a guy shows up and he simply says, God gave me a message to give you. Well, we can't just accept every Tom, Dick, and Harry who walks in and says he's a prophet. There is a prophecy test, meaning that when, that when there was a Beis HaMikdash, there was a Sanhedrin, they would have to, you'd have to apply for your prophecy license. And the way you get a prophecy license is you're tested. And the Rambam says the protocol for testing is that you have to make a lot of predictions. You know, say it's going to rain tomorrow, say the, uh, the Yankees are going to win the World Series. You have to make a prediction. It doesn't have to be an important prediction, but it has to be a prediction about the future. And only if your predictions are 100% accurate, not 95%, not 98%, 100% accurate over X number of times. Now, the X is indeterminate. It depends on how much the Sanhedrin wants to check you out. But only if there's 100% accuracy over a period of time are you then certified as an official prophet. And from that point on, anything you say, we do have to listen to as long as it doesn't violate the Torah. Right? This is the rule of credentialing a prophet, we might call it. Now, the Rambam makes a very interesting point. He says, you know, 
The only way a prophet can be credentialed or disproved is only if he prophesies a positive thing that doesn't come to pass. So if the prophet says, oh, uh, you're going to win the lottery, or the prophet says the Jewish people will be victorious in war, and they're not victorious in war, to the same degree that was prophesied, he is a false prophet. If a good thing was promised and it didn't come to pass, he is absolutely false. On the other hand, when a prophet gives a negative prophecy and says, you're going to lose the war, or many Jews are going to die, or Israel will have a terrorist attack, God forbid, and that doesn't happen, now that, do that doesn't prove he's a true prophet, but it doesn't disprove him, because even if he got that prophecy, God in his compassion and mercy may simply change his mind. Well, not, well, actually, change mind is a, the is a theological, problematical term, but Hashem will, whatever it is, decide to have midas harachamim. So a prophet can only be disproven, or an alleged prophet can only be disproven by a good thing that doesn't happen. He cannot be disproven by a bad thing that doesn't happen. Because a bad thing that doesn't happen can be attributed to God's mercy. But if God says a good thing is going to happen, that's unconditional and that's absolute. That's what the Rambam says. So the Rambam asks Akasha on his own rule from Yaakov Avinu. If you're telling me that whenever God promises something good, it's going to happen, even if you're not deserving. Because otherwise, every prophet could say this. I mean, let's say a prophet says something as good is going to happen, and it doesn't happen. Well, let the prophet say, oh, it didn't happen because your sins took it away. But that doesn't work. Because if God said a good thing is going to happen, it's going to happen. If that's the case, the Rambam asks on himself, why is Yaakov afraid that his sins make him unworthy for the divine promise. If divine promises are absolute and they're not forfeited by sin, then Yaakov shouldn't be afraid. And if Yaakov is afraid because they are forfeited by sin, then how can you disprove a prophet? You can't have both things at once. If I'm a prophet and I say something that's going to happen, so the Rambam says, if it doesn't happen, I'm a liar. Why am I a liar? Maybe it's your sins that caused it. Elamai, it's unconditional. If so, why is Yaakov afraid? Now, do you understand there's a contradiction, in other words? You can't have both propositions <coughs> at the same time. You can't tell me that Yaakov is afraid, that he loses the divine promise because of sin, and then tell me a Navi is discredited if a good thing doesn't come to pass. He could say the same thing. You lost it because of sin. So the Rambam offers a very, very interesting resolution. The Rambam says there is a difference between promise and prophecy. Promise is what Hashem says to you. Prophecy is what Hashem commands you to say to the nation. When it comes to a promise, God makes you a promise. I mean, God speaks to you. God spoke to Yaakov. God says to Yaakov, I will take care of you. I will protect you. That's a promise to Yaakov. On that, the assumption is, yeah, God is promising you, but only if you're deserving and only if you're worthy. And you can lose it by sin. And because of that, Yaakov, in his modesty, is afraid, in his modesty, of course, he's afraid that he lost it because of his sin. But prophecy is a different thing. Prophecy is not simply God's private communication to you. Prophecy is what God tells you to communicate to the people. There, once you're a prophet, if you communicate something good is going to happen, it is absolutely guaranteed. And therefore the Rambam is mechalek only by haftacha. Do I have a principle of Shema Yigrom HaChet, that the, uh, the sin will, might cause a forfeiture? It does not apply to Nevoah, and that is why a positive Nevoah must uh, take place. If it does not take place, the Navi is discredited, 
as a false prophet. Now, this is a very important rule to know because if you look at the Nevi'im generally, look at Tanakh, you see in particular there are very, very awful prophecies about the end of days, the wars of Gog and Magog. <coughs> there are psukim that say two-thirds, perhaps, of the Jews will be wiped out <coughs> and only one-third will survive. And there will be destruction and war and devastation and disease. <coughs> this is called the birth pains of Mashiach, just like a woman in labor has a lot of pain before giving birth to new life. So, too, although the Messianic era will be so beautiful, it'll be preceded with a lot of pain. Ad Kedekach, that there were opinions in the Gemara where certain rabbis say, I hope for Mashiach, but I hope I'll be dead before Mashiach mm -hmm. comes because things are going to be so rough. But based on this Rambam, there's good news. The good news is that all of these bad things don't have to happen. In other words, they will happen uh, if we don't correct ourselves, we don't try to improve ourselves. But a bad prophecy is never a guaranteed prophecy. That's the thing. Good prophecies are guaranteed. Bad prophecies are contingent. And that's a very comforting idea in the sense that we can always turn to Hashem in his rachamim. So we, if you remember, that's actually what happened to Yonah, right? Yonah. That's why Yonah didn't want to go to Nineveh, because he didn't want to get discredited. Yonah goes to Nineveh, Goyim, a Syrian, and he says, and Hashem says, in 40 days your city is going to be destroyed. And what happened was, we read it on Yom Kippur, they repented. Now granted, it may have been insincere, that's all other discussion, but whatever it is, at least temporarily, they repented. And what happened was, the city didn't get destroyed. Ah, Yonah's a prophet of God, and Yonah told them, in 40 days you're going to be destroyed. The answer is, negative prophecies can always be changed. Hashem's rachamim is never exhausted. So even when there's a prophecy, it can be canceled, it can be modified, it can be different. So this is important for us in terms of the birth pains of mm -hmm. Mashiach. That although the birth pains of Mashiach are described in a very awesome way, but the Vilna Gaon explains, based on the Rambam, we can circumvent them. Now, it doesn't mean we will circumvent them. We might have to suffer, and we've already suffered, by the way. There's been plenty of suffering. So that doesn't mean it will be canceled, but it means it might be canceled in various ways. I've mentioned before the, uh, another teaching of the Vilna Gaon that's quite fascinating. This was an oral tradition that was preserved by his Talmidim, that the final pre-Messianic war of Gog and Magog will only last 12 minutes. And for more than 250 years, nobody understood. I mean, this was a tradition they had from 1790s, that the final war of Gog and Magog will be 12 minutes. What on earth, what type of war can last for 12 minutes? Nobody had any idea. Unfortunately, in our generation, we have been blessed, blessed with the understanding that eluded the earlier generations that indeed there are very serious wars that can be over in 12 minutes, and that would be a nuclear war. And that makes something more scary when it says two-thirds will be wiped out and only one-third will survive. Well, in conventional warfare, you didn't have those types of casualties. In, God forbid, nuclear war? Yeah, uh, you could exactly have that. So it is not at all, in fact, there are other things I could tell you too. I, I don't want to, I don't want to um, you know, put you in too, too bad of a frame of mind. Uh, the Navi Zechariah describes the enemies in Gog and Magog that their flesh will be melting off their body. That is what is described. Their flesh will melt. Melt. What, what, it, what, what would that even mean? Again, we understand what that could mean in light of nuclear war and everything else. So I tell you the truth, once you're aware of this, uh, you, you almost see a nuclear war is being predicted in the Nevi'im. Now, obviously, they, they didn't talk about a bomb. In other words, Nevi'im always use language that would be understood. I mean, they talk about chariots, they talk about horses, 
but, but obviously it would apply to tanks and planes, you know, that, that's, all the Nevi'im used language that would be understood by their generation. But uh, these predictions are almost explicit once, once you understand these possibilities. But the good news is none of this is inevitable because negative prophecies can always be changed. Very important klal of the Rambam. Okay. But now, let's look at the second half. If go, going back to Yaakov. says, Yaakov is afraid and Yaakov is distressed. Yaakov is afraid that maybe he will be killed, and we just explained because Yaakov felt maybe his sins made him unworthy. But what's the repetition? Yaakov is afraid and Yaakov is distressed. So Rashi says the following. Rashi says, Yaakov is afraid he may get killed, and that's what we just talked about. But Yaakov is afraid he may have to kill. Yaakov is afraid maybe he'll kill Esav. So this is interesting. What's he so afraid of? I mean, Esav is the guy that wants to kill him. If Yaakov kills Esav, goes into hate. <laughs> that's a success. That's a victory. In other words, Yaakov seems to be worried maybe he'll lose or maybe he'll win. Well, I understand you're worried if you'll lose, but why are you worried if you win? So you see from here a very, very important insight. The Jewish people, Judaism, halacha, is not pacifistic, meaning we don't believe to turn the other cheek and let your enemy kill you. We don't believe that. We have a chiv to defend ourselves and defend other Jews. This is the famous statement of the Gemara, Habal Lahargacha, someone who's coming to kill you or to kill another person, Hashkeim Vaharik Lo, kill him first. Okay, so we fight if we have to. Uh, we kill terrorists to prevent them from doing their terrorist act. But here's the thing. We do kill, and we do fight. But you don't get a joy out of it. You don't get an excitement out of it. You're not besimcha. Killing anyone is a tragedy. It is something that should break your heart. That doesn't mean you don't do it. Sometimes you have to do it. But you do it because you have to. You don't do it because you want to. And if a Jew develops some ethic of jubilation and simcha in the destruction of life, that is a tragedy. That is a defect in a person's sensibility. Uh, we see this by the splitting of the Red Sea. right? Uh, when the Egyptians were drowning in the sea, the Red Sea, so the angels of heaven wanted to sing a song of praise to Hashem. What a wonderful thing it is that the Egyptians are drowning in the sea. And Hashem said to them, this is not the time for singing. My creatures are drowning. My creatures meaning the Egyptians. My creatures are drowning in the water. shira. You want to sing about it? You want to rejoice about it? Now, God didn't say, Oh, my poor Egyptian creatures are drowning. I better rescue them. No, God said they have to drown. But he says, I got to do this. Right? This is what justice requires. But I don't rejoice. Now, I remember years ago, in the aftermath of a terrorist incident, there was a front page uh, picture, photograph in the New York Times, of a terrorist who had murdered some people and he dipped his hands in their blood and he was dancing around like a crazy dance with the blood dripping from his fingers. The joy of spilling Jewish blood. Simcha. I shouldn't even use the Hebrew word simcha because simcha is a holy thing. I would not define this as any type of connection to holiness at all. Exactly the opposite. Mm. Unless a Jew was literally mentally ill, I could not imagine a Jew dancing with the blood of a terrorist that he killed dripping from his fingers. 
We do what we have to do. You don't enjoy it. When you enjoy it, you're in the wrong line of work. Get out of that business. And that's what Yaakov Avinu was saying. I'm not only afraid that I might get killed. I'm afraid I have to do the killing. Mm -hmm. And for a Jew, that's bad also. Golda Meir, who's not, <laughs> certainly not an authority on Judaism, I'm not uh, going to cite her, uh, but Golda Meir once made a statement that many people hate, so you may, you know, it's, it's a controversial, the way she said it was provocative and controversial, but I think there's a kernel of truth in what she said. She said, the first part especially hurts, hurts a lot of people, so I'm quoting her, this is not me. Uh, I always say, no hate mail, sorry, it's become, become my mantra. Uh, and that is, she said, we may forgive the Arabs for killing our children. That's the part that people hate, like who says? But then she said, but we can't forgive the Arabs for making us kill their children. Now, the first part of the statement, we can forgive the Arabs for killing our children, we, we, can, we can delete that. You know, <laughs> maybe we can't forgive them, okay. But the second part, I think, has a chachma. She says, in addition to their killing our children, the fact that we have to kill their children is something that hurts us as well. And I, I actually agree with the second part of her statement. The first part, as they say, that's, that's the one that rankles people the wrong way. But the second part is Emes. And this is what Jacob Avinu was saying when he says, I am afraid I will have to be a murderer, even if it's justifiable, even if it's justifiable. Right, so that's kind of a sense. And that's why, you know, pe you know, we knock the army and, you know, Yeshiva Boy's army and we have controversies and different fights and arguments. But I want to say one thing about the IDF, and that is even the secular part of the army, even the part that's not religious, has the highest regard for human life than virtually every army in the world. Meaning most armies, including the United States, they have, when they have to get terrorists or whatever it is, they'll do aerial bombings. Now, aerial bombing, by definition, has a lot of what are called collateral damage, meaning a lot of innocent people get hurt, a lot of homes get destroyed. You know what Israel does? Israel, go, first of all, they send these warnings, which is pretty amazing, meaning <laughs> they, they order, you know, they tell people, evacuate, get out, get out, get out, get out. So all the bad guys are given like four, you know, three days warning to get out of there, you know. Number one, they give them warnings to these enemies. Uh, number two, uh, they go house to house. House to house. They don't bomb from the sky. They go house to house to house. You have 19-year-old kids looking for terrorists. I mean, you can open the house and they could just have a machine gun down. They, they can have a 10-year-old with a machine gun. Yeah. Open the house, you know, you get gunned down. But they do it because they have a commitment to minimize the loss of life. That's why it's, again, I mean, uh, I'm not saying there aren't mistakes and I'm not saying there aren't accidents. There are sometimes accidents. A tank goes in reverse and a Palestinian kid gets killed. I mean, that, that's sad and that's regrettable. But these are in the nature of accidents. These are not, so when the world equates, well, an accident of a kid getting run over, which again, it's tragic, it is tragic, but it's an accident with deliberate terrorists that, that target buses and blow them up. I mean, it's, it's a Meshuggah a comparison to even, and then of course, we have the great moral voices like Syria and Iraq, you know, condemning, you know, Israeli brutality. Like, wow, I mean, these are like the great tzaddikim yeah. of the generation who are supposed to kind of give us lessons in Musr and ethics <laughs> and, and, and morality uh, in the United Nations. Uh, you know, okay, I don't want to get too political about it, but, but uh, the point is that Judaism says, just as we don't want to be killed, we don't want to be on the other side of it either. Okay. But then, uh, when Yaakov prays, Yaakov says a very interesting thing. Yaakov says to God, Hashem, na, please save me. Miyad achi, from my brother. Miyad Esav, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esav. Well, what's the repetition there? Yaakov only has one brother. He says, save me from my brother. Save me from Esav. Why, why does he repeat it in that way? 
So the Beis HaLevi says a very fascinating word. The Beis HaLevi says that Yaakov has another fear besides the fear of being killed or having to kill. Yaakov is afraid of an Esav who comes to destroy him. Yes. But Yaakov is afraid of the Esav who comes in the guise of a friendly brother, right? Esav could come and say, hey, you're my buddy, you're my brother, join me, work with me. In other words, the Beis Levi says that the Jew faces two dangers in their interaction with the non-Jewish world. One is, they'll try to kill me. The other is, they'll try to make me their best friend. Both of them are dangerous. One is a danger to my body, but the other is a danger to my soul. Assimilation, intermarriage. Now, in Western cultures, although I do understand that anti-Semitism is rising and I do understand there are dangers to our physical survi survival, th that's true, but by and large, the predominant danger let's say that a Jew faces in America, is not like the Holocaust where I'm afraid that they're going to kill me. Although, although, you know, it can happen. But it's primarily the spiritual dangers. Assimilation, intermarriage, lack of Jewish education, the culture of immorality, uh, whether it's uh, abortion on demand or transgenderism or whatever it is the hedonism, the woke culture, all of those different aspects. Which means, if you think about it historically, Jewish religious life tends, I mean, tends to do better in times of persecution than in times of affluence and acceptance. The Baba Rebbe used to say, mm -hmm. it was easier to be from in Siberia than suburbia. Mm -hmm. Siberia, he said, Siberia, he says because... Uh, when you're rejected by the nations, so you turn inward and you try to serve Hashem. When you're accepted and you can do anything you want, mm. that's when Yiddishkeit gets abandoned. You know, in the beginning of the 19th century, Napoleon was going through Europe, conquering this country and that country and that country. And he finally reached Russia. You know, the Tsar, Russia, he was going to conquer Russia. And the Jews under the Tsar at the time were living an absolutely miserable life, in every way, miserable life. Poverty, taxes, imprisonment, uh, exile. They were constantly ordered to move. They, they were only allowed to live in a certain area called the Pale of Settlement. And the Russians kept on changing the uh, boundaries. Yeah. Oh, got to get out in a week, you know, move somewhere else, etc. For no reason at all. And Napoleon promised, and he made good on his promise, by the way, to give Jews civil rights, emancipation, freedom. No ghettos anymore. You can go to universities. You can own property. You can engage in businesses. All of which could not be done in Russia. So there was a machlokas among the gedolim of Europe. Should we pray for Napoleon's victory? Or should we pray for the Tsar's victory? Many Gedolim said, life under the Tsar is so wretched and Napoleon would give freedom to the Jewish people. Let's pray for that freedom. The one exception was the Alter Rebbe, Rav Shner Zalman of Liadi, the, the, the Balotanya. He said he was davening for the Tsar to win. And not only did he daven for the Tsar to win, but he actually raised money for the Tsar's army. He raised money. Some people thought, this is crazy. This is nuts. Why do you want the Tsar to win? The Tsar is awful. He said, because the Tsar afflicts our bodies, but our neshamas are intact. Indeed, think about Torah life in Russia, Poland, Lithuania. The Vilna Gaon, Rabbi Kivega. Look at what you produced under those conditions. And the truth of the matter is, not, not that the Alter Rebbe needs my haskama, but he was 100% right. Uh, Napoleon did emancipate, of course, he, Napoleon was not successful in Russia, right? But 
in the countries that he did emancipate, Jews were given political rights, freedoms. They could go to universities. They could be doctors and lawyers. But what happened in the aftermath of the French Revolution and Napoleon was the reform movement, the Haskalah, the so-called Jewish Enlightenment. It's exactly the case. When you're given freedom, you throw everything away sometimes. That's what happened in the United States, where people from religious families, they come to a free society. Until there were a lot of yeshivas, which really post-World War II, but if you think about the Jews who came to the United States from the end of the 1800s to the first few decades of the 20th century, that's called the lost generation. Most of the children of Orthodox people, literally, they, well, they, they certainly stopped being Orthodox, that's for sure, but, but many of them intermarried, some of them converted, they're lost, they're, they're not even identifiably Jewish anymore. It's called the lost generation. The Jews that were born in America between 1900 and around 1930. A lost, I'm not saying it's 100%, Baruch Hashem, there were some heroic people that remained religious even then, but the vast majority, <coughs> the vast majority. I mean, I don't want to mention particular names, but there was a chash of a rav who came to America, and uh, many would have said had he remained in Europe, he would have been one of the gedolei ador mamish, such a great, great, great person in learning. And he lived in a place that there were no yeshivas, there were no chadarim, there was nothing. This goes back to the 1920s. There was nothing. And uh, he, has grand, he has grandchildren and great-grandchildren who are not even identifiably Jewish. And this was a person who was uh, a gadol hador. Right? That was the situation. So this is what Yaakov is afraid of. Yaakov is afraid not only of the Esav who comes to kill me, but the Esav, who comes as my brother, that's even worse sometimes. So it's interesting that this is an interesting perspective about the difference between the, ho the holiday of Hanukkah and the holiday of Purim. Purim was an attack on our physical survival. Haman didn't care about religion. Haman didn't care. Haman was exactly like Hitler. Hitler didn't care if you were from or not from. In fact, even if you were a Jew who converted to Christianity, and there were, you still died in the concentration camps. Made no difference. Now, in an ultimate deep spiritual sense, Hitler was actually fighting the Torah, but, but at least in terms of what he was actually doing, he was not fighting the Torah, he was trying to destroy the Jewish people. Haman the same way. Haman did not differentiate between religious Jews and not religious Jews. Haman wanted to physically destroy the Jewish people. Hanukkah is very different. It's true that Hanukkah involved a war. Yeah. And it's true that Antiochus murdered Jews. But it was totally over religion. In fact, in a perverse way, you could even say Antiochus was a civil libertarian. Antiochus was not an anti-Semite. What did Antiochus say to the Jewish people? I will give you full political and economic rights mm -hmm. as long as you give up mm -hmm. these commandments, whatever the commandments are. So he's not anti-Semitic. Every, every Jew who wanted had a way out. And unfortunately, many Jews took that way out. Don't keep Shabbos. Don't keep kosher. Don't circumcise your children. And you can be a very successful citizen of these Greek countries, these Greek provinces. So you have to understand this. It's true that Hanukkah was a war, but the challenge of Hanukkah was not our physical survival. We had a very easy way to physically survive. Just stop keeping those commandments. Hanukkah was a war of Ruchnius, as opposed to Purim which was a war of Gashmias. Now the Levush, one of the great poskim, says a very interesting idea. The Levush points out that on Purim, there is a chiyuf to have a meal. You must eat a Purim meal during the day of Purim, which means you have to wash on bread and eat uh, 
bread and with meat, actually, the meat, the suda should be basar uh, and bench. This is a chiyav. This is actually one of the chiyav. It's not just a nice thing to have a porn party. There's a chiyav of suda. On Hanukkah, even though people make parties and people have, uh, have latkes and everything else, but there's no chiyav. I mean, if I, don't, if I don't feel like eating on Hanukkah, I don't have to have a suda on Hanukkah, any day of Hanukkah. So what's the difference? In both cases, Hashem brought salvation to the Jewish people, so why is there a chiv of Sauda on Purim and there's no chiv of Sauda on Hanukkah? So the Levush says very beautifully, on Purim, it was our bodies that were in danger. So when God redeems our bodies, we thank Him with our bodies. We eat and we drink. Hanukkah, our bodies were not in danger. What was in danger was our neshama. So when Hashem allows us to save our neshama, we don't celebrate by eating and drinking, we celebrate by lighting candles, which the the light of the candle is a symbol of the light of the neshama. You see? And that's the difference. And this goes back to Yaakov's prayer. When Yaakov says, save me from my brother who wants me to assimilate, that's what Hanukkah was about. Save me from the one who wants to kill me physically. That's what Purim is about. So in Yaakov Avinu's prayer, save me from my brother, save me from Esav, there actually is an allusion to the future salvations of Hanukkah and, and Purim. Now, one other uh, thought to go backwards a little bit. When Yaakov sends a message to Esav, that I'm coming in town. Hey, Esav, I'm here. I was with Lava, now I'm here. So it's an interesting machlokas. And then he gets the news that Esav is coming after him with 400 men. Should Yaakov have initiated that contact at all? You know, the Medrash quotes a pasuk in Mishle that says that start, sometimes getting involved with a quarrelsome person is like pulling the ears of a dog when it's asleep. Imagine the situation. You have a dog that's asleep, and you decide to kind of lift the dog up by, like a beagle, a hound. You lift it up by these big floppy ears. Well, even if you have a very good-natured dog, uh, there's a famous picture actually with Lyndon Johnson doing that, I remember, he picked up, but you know, the dog's gonna bite you, probably. You know, it's a little annoying, and I can't, I can't blame the dog. I can't blame the dog either. You know, the dog is sleeping, and there's a saying in English, let sleeping dogs lie. Right? Let them sleep. So here we have, Yaakov is coming back to Eretz Israel. Esav has his place. So Yaakov sends a message, hey, Esav, I'm coming back, you know. Uh, so the Medrash actually says, according to one opinion, that if Yaakov would have done nothing at all, Esav might not even have noticed, uh, and everything would have been good, so there is a Chazal that actually faults Yaakov for even initiating the contact. Yeah. Is, Yaakov kind of, is that why Yaakov kind of gets punished a little bit by having to... By, by, by having to what? If he didn't say anything to Yaakov, yeah. there wouldn't have been an issue. But yeah. because he, he kind of announced it, it was, it was kind of an issue. Did he get punished for that? Like on an error of the scale or no? Well, um... I don't know if he gets punished, but, but Chazal are critical of it. Chazal say you brought more trouble on yourself uh, than you had to do. But there's another view. In other words, there are different views in Chazal. Some say, no, no, no. It was very good that Yaakov had two strategies. When you're confronted with a hostile force, one strategy is giving gifts, conciliation, peace gestures, and the other strategy is get ready for war if that doesn't work. And the third, which is the most important, is prayer, right? These are Yaakov's three-step plan, uh, gift-giving, preparations for war, and, of course, prayer to Hashem. So it's interesting that the sages are apparently uh, in disagreement whether Yaakov's initiating of contact was a good step to make or whether he should have just ignored the whole thing and Asa wouldn't have even have noticed and the like. But be this it may, though, the first thing that Yaakov says in his message to Esav is, I have lived with Lavan. Right? Famous words, Im Lavan, 
Garti. So Rashi has a beautiful drash on that. Garti means I lived, but it happens to be the same letters as Taryag, 613. So he's telling Esav, I was with Lavan, and I have kept all of those years, the 613 mitzvos. Now, what... Why, why is that a useful bit of information for Esav? I mean, like, you know, right. what's the point of telling Esav that? So some say that Yaakov is telling Esav, it's almost like a tough, a tough guy, don't mess around with me. I have the merit of the Torah that I kept. So even when he's sending the gifts, he's kind of saying, let's not fool around. In fact, even when he says to Esav, oh, it's so good to see you. I look at your face and you're like an angel of God. So the Mephorshim say, Yaakov is hinting, I know what angels look like. So, you know, kind of like, <laughs> so you have that, what do they call it, a velvet fist? Like, you know, your velvet glove around the fist. Uh, that even in that. Um, but the Mephorshim asks Akasha that although it is true that Chazal have a tradition that Yaakov kept, the, the Avos kept the whole Torah before it was given, but that's only when they lived in the land of Israel, mm. not when they lived in Chutz Laaretz. So, and Yaakov indeed married two sisters in Chutz Laaretz, which is against the Torah. So how could Yaakov possibly say, I kept the 613 mitzvahs? So the Chassam Seifer has a beautiful answer. He says that shomarti, I, shomarti, I kept, does not mean I kept, but it means... I was eagerly waiting for the opportunity that I can come back and do it. In other words, he shows from other psukim that shomar is to eagerly wait. And he says, every second I was in Chutz Laaretz, I was waiting and yearning for when I can come back to Eretz Israel. And that's an important point, that even if a Jew is not Zoha yet to live in the land of Israel, there should always be a yearning in your heart to come. The interesting paradox is that sometimes the yearning is stronger when you're not here. Someone asked Rav Hutner after he made Aliyah, is there anything he missed about Chutz Laaretz? And he said, yes, I miss the yearning I had in Chutz Laaretz to live in Eretz Yisrael. Mm -hmm. Interesting paradox, right? Because... When you're here, so unfortunately, there are frustrations, there are difficulties, you know, it's hot, and the buses, and, and what, what are the, the banks, and the lines. Uh, I've, been here, I've been here myself for uh, around uh, 13 years. I still don't know how lines work in banks. That's why I, you know, somehow, somehow, wherever I am is always the wrong, whatever it is. And the point is, this is a frustrating place. And then sometimes what happens is we lose sight of what a zechus it is to live here. So interestingly enough, when you're not here, you can sometimes have a purity of vision. Maybe it's an idealization. Yeah. So what Yaakov is saying is, for all the years I wasn't here, I was yearning to come back every single second. And that should be the attitude of every Jew even if they're not here yet, but even more importantly, if you are here, you should continue to have that type of attitude, the Hakara Satov to Hashem of being in Eretz Yisrael. Okay, wish you all have a good Shabbos and be well.